another episode of the Guman Human Experience. Today, I've got a special guest by the name of Paul Oneid, who is a strength and conditioning coach who has tons of experience working with collegiate athletes, power lifters, and generic public. He is the owner of Master Athletic Performance. He is also the co-founder of Metrolife. I hope you enjoy this episode. We go through tons of different topics about nutrition, to mindset, to tracking, to macros, to weight loss, and just an overall great chat about health. I hope you enjoy, and if you have any feedback, let us know. Have a beautiful day. So you're back in Ottawa now. Are you from, you're all from Ottawa originally though, right? Yep, grew up in Ottawa, did my undergrad at U Ottawa in uh, human kinetics. Yeah. And then um, after that, moved to the US and did uh, two master's degrees there, and then moved back to Kingston, Ontario, where I was the head strength coach at Queens yeah. um, for about a year, and then transitioned into my current role uh, as a rehab specialist with Manulife. Um, okay. So, I wondered what you did during the day. Cause I was like, are you a full-time coach or are you actually working uh, for a company? So I started once I left collegiate strength and conditioning, I kind of started trying to build a business and it wasn't really what I wanted to be doing because I had, I left strength and conditioning a lot due to burnout. So trying to run a business doing something you had previously been burnt out doing, it just didn't fit. And I, and I fell into my current role with Manulife. It's a work from home position, um, essentially a subject matter expert in rehabilitation, which was my niche as a coach anyway. Um, and it because it's work from home, it allows me a ton of freedom. So I was able to slowly build my coaching business online and, and a, a few in-person clients on the side to the point now where it's, uh, it's, it's a good, good extra source of income for me. It's still fun, but I also have the security of the full-time job. You know, I was talking to a, <clears throat> excuse me, a police officer and he does a lot of coaching on the side. And mm -hmm. he was just saying that he could never imagine having to coach people full time because he goes, now I can pick and choose. And I'm sure you're in that boat too, right? You can pick and choose who you want to work with instead of chasing a paycheck sometimes. So, you yeah. don't get to burn out of your passion, right? Yeah, I definitely felt, uh, I definitely felt, especially doing the, the collegiate strength and conditioning, because it's such a, it's a different beast. I mean, you're, you're in workouts at 530 in the morning. In Canadian strength, in, in Canadian athletics, it's, it's different because the kids come to train around their class schedule, where when I was in the U.S. coaching, it was the kids train and go to class around their sport. Yes. So my hours at Queens, I was at work at 5 a.m. and I didn't leave until 10 p.m. And uh, it was it was exhausting. It was it was incredibly re rewarding, but after a certain point, it just wasn't the quality of life that I was looking for, and that's what prompted this shift. And so you obviously in the U.S. I mean, it's a different gym culture all there. Is there? Oh yeah. What are some of the differences? Like I know that in the CFL with the teams that I've worked with. There's a culture shift when they, when like between the CFL, the NFL, and just even NCAA, even high school football. So in, when you were in, you were in Florida, right? So I was in Florida for two years. I, and then I was in Pittsburgh for two years. Okay. And then I spent about seven months back in Florida. Gotcha. And so what were some of the differences that you noticed? Like, did you work in the same sports? On both um, sides there was a few crossovers. So, um, I got into coaching while I was an undergrad at Ottawa U, started working with some of the guys as they transitioned from, um, from their collegiate football towards CFL tryouts and things like that. Um, and then when I moved to the States, it was, okay, I'm going to go down and work with football because that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Ended up working primarily with football, but then also men and women's soccer, track and baseball. Um, and that was just completely eye-opening to the level of professionalism that they have to support with. And any amount of money. Like, I, I, I went from training our U Ottawa football players in the, essentially, the campus rec. The dungeon? Uh, we were in the dungeon, and then we were also at the complex. Um, I forget what they called it now. Now it has a name. It was just like the sports complex now But when I was there. But uh, to a football and like a, like a specific athletic gym that was 12,000 square feet with 24 places to exercise. And like it had matching dumbbell and selectorized areas on either side of the room so that you could split the room in half and have two teams do the exact same thing. 
like that was something I had never been exposed to. And it really kind of changed my paradigm of what could actually be possible. Um, and then when I got to Queens and they were like, yeah, we want you to implement a U.S. style strength and conditioning program. I was like, okay, hey, I know how to do that, but I need X, Y, and Z. And they're like, oh, no, you can't have that. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it, it's, it's, I think when I was talking to one of my previous employers, uh, he was in the NFL. And he said to me, he's like, there was no, even I, I remember interviewing for the Montreal Impact. And they're like, Harry, a lot of the questions you're asking, you don't have a budget. Like, we give you a card, you just go get it. And I'm like, oh. And, and, and when you're here, it's like, well, everything's got to be allotted and budgeted. Whereas over there, it's like, you can make our players better. It's like, okay, what do you need? Right? So, yeah. Yeah. Like my budget at Queens uh, for, per month was like $125. <laughs> so like I could buy two mini bands. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and at South Florida, every student athlete, so they had 21 varsity sports. So every student athlete got a MacBook Pro. Um, they got all their like clothing, track suits, everything was Under Armour, all their shoes, all their cleats, all their everything um, was paid for. They had full, every team had their own team room with lockers and showers and meeting rooms and tech and all that stuff. And um, there was three football practice fields. There was three soccer practice fields. There was two baseball diamonds and a game stadium. There was X, Y, you know, and then, but I also had the other side, like from South Florida, I went to Robert Morris in Pittsburgh, where it was going from a big division one, a school to a small division one, double a school, which if people aren't familiar, the a or double a has to do with the, uh, the conference that the football team plays in. Um, usually it's related to the size of the school and Robert Morris had only 5,000 students, 500 of which were student athletes. It's like a 10th of the school is athletes. They had like d kind of dilapidated practice facilities. And our weight room was like 2000 square feet compared to 12,000 square feet. But again, we had 18 varsity sports that we had to get through that room. So it was just a different dynamic. And then going down again, I went to a division two school at the university of Tampa, but Tampa is one of the most expensive schools in the country. I think tuitions in the neighborhood of $56,000 a year for an international student. Wild. Um, so their weight room was beautiful. It was a little bit smaller, but they had less teams and the complex that they played in and practice in was brand new. So I've seen kind of the whole gamut of what's available, but the prep, the prevailing theme is that in the U S if you go to school to play a sport, you're a, a student athlete and, and people are like, is this going to be on video or, or just audio? Cause oh, I always used to be too. like, I'm a student and they'd hold up the number two mm -hmm. athlete and they'd hold up the number one because yeah. it's like, I'm here to play sports and also go to school. Yeah. I think there's a different culture there too, though. Right. I mean, there's a lot of people who, um, like if they didn't play sports, you don't know where they would end up. Right. Oh, and which then, happens. Yeah. And then number two, I think, but the culture there is like, we want to be the best. Right. Yes. And you know, I'm sure that you are in situations where you're being pulled into meetings and you're being asked like character of this, of this person. And that could make or break their starting point of where they are. Whereas in Canada, it's like, well, they didn't care if he didn't show up to the gym and give him the hundred percent, they'll still put him in if he's a first stringer. I don't know if you noticed that difference, but like a little heard, bit in the States it has to do more like financially motivated. Cause gotcha. like if you have the starting quarterback of the football team is a projected, you know, second or third round draft pick and he's a complete butthead. Yeah. They're going to just let him play football. Okay. Gotcha. You know, there, that, so um, there is that because if the coach benches him, then the coach loses games, loses his job, loses his livelihood. Um, it's a business in the U S it's a business in Canada. I would say it's a service. Yeah. So it's something available for students, but it's not driving income and revenue to the, to the school. Yeah. Yeah. No. And then was it a hard change for you to make that shift from U S to Canadian football, like back into the OAU? Um, it was, it, it presented its own challenges, but the kids want the same thing. They want to be the best. They want to compete at yeah. the highest level. And, I almost felt bad because I was so constrained within my, um, within my situation 
that I couldn't really provide what I felt that they needed. But you make the best of your situation. Like I, I went from being on a staff of, you know, we had five full-time coaches and 15 interns at South Florida to a head coach and two assistants with five or six interns at Robert Morris. And then myself and the other head coach at UTampa with some interns to just being me, myself, and I with 50 undergraduate students. So there's, there's constraints. And I definitely just felt bad that I couldn't do more for them. And would you travel with some of the teams too while you're in uh, Queens? At Queens, no, because I was, I was in charge of all of them. Gotcha. Um, but in the States, yeah, I did travel with a few of the teams. Awesome. And then so now you're working with Manual Life. You've started your own consulting on the side. Yep. Um, so what are you doing during these COVID times with your clients? Like, what do you do? First off, let's start with what yourself. I mean, you know, you're a pretty active guy. You love going to the gym. I'm sure that you've had to come up with some techniques for yourself. So what are some things that you're doing uh, to help yourself during COVID to protect your health, protect your mindset and protect your body? So for my training itself, I've been quite fortunate. One of my clients and friends actually lives like a 15 minute walk from my house. So <laughs> we train in his garage. Um, I've had to make some modifications to my movement selection, but other than that, I've, I've been able to train normally. Um, and it gives me an excuse to take a 15 minute walk to his place and a 15 minute walk home. Um, in terms of my mental health, uh, you know, in my life, I'm in a bit of a period of transition, having just moved back to Ottawa from Calgary. So protecting my mental health has been very important to me. So keeping a steady routine, um, is number one. So I actually just wrote a blog post for our company, um, about routine and about discipline because I'm, I'm very much of the mindset that there are certain things, certain non-negotiable things that I need to do every day to make sure that I'm doing the best that I can. Um, so I make sure to take care of those. And then I have time allocated after that to, to do things that I think are fun and, or do things that I can enjoy, whether that's just relaxing or whether that's devoted to another project or hanging out with family, um, doing Zoom calls and things like that. So for me personally, it's, it's very much routine oriented, also setting up my new space. So setting up my home in a way that I feel comfortable. Um, and again, I'm, I'm very much like a, once I have a dining room table, I'll no longer be eating on the couch. Yeah. And once I have an office set up, I'll no longer be working on the couch or eat or the dining room table and segregating pieces for what they're meant to be for. Um, learning different strategies that allow me to maintain presence in the moment uh, because right now we're being bombarded with things that normally wouldn't be on our plates, whether that's childcare or child education, um, you know, uh, financial constraints um, and everything that comes along with that. It's, these are humongous stressors that we're not used to handling, but by being so disciplined in the day-to-day -day routine aspect you in my opinion you're better able to accommodate those things that have come up out of the blue so for me that's a that's a calming sensation um and so how do you I, put that together so obviously you do your workouts but I, for me what i want to make sure is where like how are you doing that so we know every day okay. you're going to go for a yeah, workout yeah. for an hour or two but do you journal do you take 20 yeah. minutes do you do a sunday of planning and organizing how, how does that look like for you in a day so daily basis, uh, I wake up around the same time every day. So between 5.30 and 6 a.m., gotcha. I'll come downstairs, have my coffee, uh, journal, and then I'll use my app. I'll use MetriLife, uh, which is an app I developed. We'll um, talk about that. I definitely want to yeah, talk we'll about MetriLife. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, so I'll use MetriLife. I'll make my breakfast. Uh, I'll eat my breakfast. And then if it's depending on what time it is and how long I spent journaling, uh, I might answer a couple emails. And then around 7 a.m., I'll take my dog to the Conroy Pit or around the neighborhood. We'll go for a 30-minute walk. And I usually listen to an audio book. Uh, right now, I'm, list I'm listening to Sapiens. Very right. good book. Yeah, I have the great. book. I've read, I've read the two. I read the second one by accident. Oh. So then I read the third. And then I bought the uh, first one. I just bought it. She's a great author. He or yeah. she. I'm I have no idea. But the, the narrator is <laughs> British, so it's like very calming. Yeah. Uh, so I'll take my dog to the, to the Conroy pit. And then by the time we get back, it's around eight 30 and I start my work day with Manulife. Um, within my work day, I structure breaks. So I will put my phone on do not disturb, which is the best feature that your phone is available with. 
I put it down, I put it off to the side, I get my work done. I have a timer as well where I'll take breaks every 45 to 50 minutes, get up, walk around, go to the bathroom, grab a drink. Around lunchtime, I'll go for another walk, listen to the book, take time for myself. Um, if I have extra time at lunch, I will answer some more emails for my, for my clients. And then I'm back to work for Manulife until do about you, Do you eat and then go for a walk? Sorry to interrupt. Do you eat, then go for a walk, or do you walk, then eat? How, how does that work? I, I eat first. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. No, because so I'm a big I'll, believer in taking post-work meal walks, right? So I just want to... Yeah. yeah, it's a big... Uh, that's, that's been a game changer. And I'll kind of... there's we're, We'll talk about weight loss towards the... Like yeah. in this conversation, that's definitely going to play into it. And then by around 3.30, I wind down my workday. I'll have my pre-workout meal. Um, I'll walk over to the gym, train for a couple hours, walk home, eat my post-workout meal. And then I have about three, three and a half hours more of work time to do. Um, so a lot of my day is work. Uh, but What's your passion project then at that point? It's my passion project is yeah. what I want to be doing. Um, and uh, in time, balance, balance comes. It, it ebbs and flows. And I firmly believe that balance shifts in your life depending on times of the year and things that you have on your plate. Um, being a single guy living alone, like I don't have other stressors that are placed upon me. So I have a lot of extra time to devote to things that I really enjoy and believe in. And then, so then what time would you usually go to bed at? So you're up at five thirty six. So you probably in bed at 10, 10, 30. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Um, so I, I'm unforgiving with my seven hours. I will always provide myself seven hours of sleep no matter what. Um, when I'm prepping for a competition, so I, I compete in powerlifting, when I'm prepping for a competition, I'm, I, I'll push that to eight. Gotcha. Yeah. And so but right now, training doesn't mandate that I need that. So. And so obviously they're not competing right now. So what are your, so obviously, so you've got your, um, your schedule for the day, which yep. seems pretty good. Like really just simple, right? Like I think there's yep. something to it. I think that's why I wanted to get into that because I think people think that, you know, when they look at people, say, oh, they must be doing something fancy or crazy. It's like, no, we just use our watch, timer. Uh, we enjoy taking our walks, our sunshine. Like, there's yep. just little breaks in between, but just it's like a bear. It doesn't stop all day long, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, I'm a big believer that a there, there should be simplicity in planning and savagery in execution regardless of what I do. I make my plan as simple as I can, and then I execute it to the best of my abilities. Because it, without, if you, if you overcomplicate things, the execution becomes a chore. And that's true with everything. I, I say that all the time to my clients, I'm like, just under, underthink it, over execute it, right? So yes. if you wanna eat better, cook for two hours. Don't just say that you're going to eat healthier. No, you have to say, I'm gonna cook for two hours a week, and I'm going to make my lunch every day. There, planned, simple, that's the goal for the day. Let's yep. get it done and then over execute that instead of being like, well, Harry, should I do keto or should I do, it's like, no, 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 just start, just start somewhere. So really big fan of that. And so one of the big things that intrigued me about why I wanted to bring you on to the podcast was I remember, was it, I don't know, two years ago or three years ago, yeah. you really leaned out. Yeah, oh yeah. And I remember you saying something like you hated it, it sucked. And that you would you wouldn't recommend this to people. I don't know if it was, it was a post or something like that. But yeah, I, I remember it because it came up recently. And the reason I think that this this podcast is so timely is because I'm actually dieting again. Yes, same, and, same goal. Yeah. And I think one of the big things that you know one of my goals of my podcast are is to help people realize that what people are doing in social media isn't truly what like isn't always the most glamorous lifestyle or thing no. that you're going to be able to achieve and. Well, cause a lot of my clients will say to us, and I think a lot of people will say, well, why can't I have more energy diet and get lean and be the strongest I can be and be in a great mood? It's like, I think there's a, a certain point that you're going to hit that you can have all that, but then there's yes. a, a plateau breaker where it's like, okay, you're just going to have to go into workouts aren't going to be as nice. It's going to be a little crusty. You might need a little bit more sleep. And so when you did that, um, tell us a little bit about that. What, what was the reasoning behind it? What was the story? I mean, just take a quick five minutes to tell us about that story. Yeah, I sure. So I, the decision to do that, I've always been a bit of a, I would always eat clean, but I would, then I would like binge eat or, uh, you know, not, I've seen you on TV on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, what is it? <laughs> on a burger place. 
Yeah, I'm yeah. Like, I know him. <laughs> yeah, you got to eat here. Yeah, yeah you got to eat here. It was, a, it was a burger place. Sorry to cut you off, but yeah. Oh, that's okay. Um, yeah, so I'd like, I'd eat quite clean, but usually under eat. And then I would have cravings and binge eat and, and do all those things. But in general, I had quite a, a, a healthy diet and I was able to put on quite a bit of muscle mass, you know, squatting well over 800 pounds, deadlifting over 700 pounds. Amazing. And um, at that point, I actually injured myself quite seriously in a competition. I tore my quad. So I was like, well, I can't really train the way I want to be training. I need a goal. Like I, I always have to have something in my mind to push for. So then was, I'm just going to get really, really shredded. So I reached out to a buddy of mine who was a power lift, or a, a bodybuilding coach. And I was like, let's pre pretend you're prepping me for a show. So I did everything. I did the cardio. I did the chicken and rice. I did, you know, the, the training where it was like, you know, feel the muscle. Don't worry about the weights, all that stuff. And, um, it worked, but it took a lot of struggles. I went from doing 20 minutes of cardio a day to doing 40 minutes twice a day, uh, from about 3000 calories down to about 1600 calories. How long um, was that block though? That 3000 to six, obviously it wasn't, it was day. about, so Four it was weeks. a progressive decline in calories, yeah. a progressive increase in cardio. And it was over the course of about 12 to 14 weeks. Awesome. So again, just like, just like training, your diet should be progressive. Um, and that's something that I still believe in. But what that taught me was that there was a point about midway through where I was like, man, I'm making pretty good progress and I don't feel like I'm dieting. I think this might be sustainable. And I looked in the mirror and I was like, I kind of like what I look like. This is cool. But I'm like, no, I committed to this. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get, pretend I'm getting ready for a show. And I did it to a T. I only cheated when he allowed me to. And when he told me to, I only, I ate only the macros that he prescribed me with the foods that he prescribed me. I did all of the cardio and it was about maybe three weeks before we decided, okay, we're going to go to May 31st or sorry, April, March 31st. That was the end point that after that first week of March, I felt like I was a zombie. I felt like I couldn't concentrate at work. I couldn't, uh, and, and I'll be completely honest, I couldn't be intimate with my wife. I was so tired. Yeah. Um, I was just dead to the world, like zoning through the day. But every single day, I got visibly leaner and leaner and leaner and leaner. So that progress got super addicting. Yeah. Um, afterwards, we did, a, we did a, a reverse diet. So slow, progressive increase in calories over the next little bit to a point where it was kind of sustainable. And I did gain about, I did gain about 10 pounds back, but I maintained quite a bit of leanness because at my lowest weight, I don't truly believe I weighed that. I think I was just glycogen depleted and dehydrated when I got down that low, but I settled around that two, 225 mark. And at that point I was like, okay, time to focus on powerlifting, focus to a more performance oriented diet, got back into training. My quad was healed and I was good. And I was actually able to maintain most of the leanness um, and get back up to like that 235 range and, and stay with abs. So like for me, that was pretty cool being a fat kid my whole life. And the reason I think that story is important is that it completely changed my relationship with food because of those 12 to 14 weeks, I only had one workout where it was so bad I had to leave. Other than that, I was still loading the, the bar. I was still increasing the weights I was using. And I used some strategies that I know would work for me. Like I didn't perform any squats, benches, or deadlifts because I know my max is on those exercises and I didn't want to know if I was getting weaker. So I chose movements that I could easily progress. Um, you know, I did things that I normally wouldn't do. Uh, I got out of my comfort zone. I did the CrossFit Open. Like just things that I normally would not be able to do with more, more weight on my frame. The total weight loss is about 25 pounds. Gotcha. So can I ask you one question? I think one thing that I want to hone in, when you said, I feel like I'm not dieting, I feel really good here. How yep. many weeks in were you? Cause so how well, long was the total cut? Three months? Yeah, we'll say three months. Just so about halfway through like that six week mark, I was probably doing about, 35 to 40 minutes of cardio a day. The calories were around 2250 to 2500. So like not crazy low. Okay. Um, and 
I was still exercising five times a week and it was, it was within my routine. Like I would wake up, I'd do my 45 minutes of cardio. I'd go about my day and then I'd train in the evening. It was like very easy. Um, it, but once I got to that point where I was around that, like 223 to 220 range and I wanted to push for that 215. Miserable. It was bad. Yeah. It, it, that's something I, I see a lot of my clients as I say to myself, I, what, what the reason why I hone in on that is that, that, that feeling of that six to eight week is kind of where I think most people will be very happy with, right? Yep. But I'm not the guy, and I always tell people, my clientele isn't the people who want to go from the 225, in your case, down to 215. I just want to bring them to that 225 and be like, you can feel really good, look good, and not have to overstress yourself. But if you want to go to that next level, then obviously there's coaches who are very good at that. Yeah. Um, and so when you're saying you're doing your cardio in the morning, are you just going for... 20, 30, 40 minutes of walking? Or are you talking running when you're talking about cardio or biking? Or oh, something? at that point, it was uh, it was like 40 minutes hard on the elliptical. Like okay, gotcha. 150 beats per minute cardio. Okay, so yeah, you're crushing yourself. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so then from there, you went into the deepness of the cut. But I think the key is is that you, you did find a point where you, it was sustainable. Yes, right? absolutely. And you and I both know if you were able to continue that for a little bit longer, it probably would have got a little bit leaner. But- what, yep. what I love the fact that you said is that you cycled it. And I think that's yep. something that's important that, you, that a lot of people should listen to is that you didn't just say, I'm going to try to be a power lifter that's trying to train for a body. Like you took your injury, you embraced it. And you say, well, I still can do this. Let's go after it. But then once that's done, it's done. Then you also did the reverse diet, which was how long? A month, two months, three months? Probably about a month and a half. It's probably about six weeks of progressively just adding a couple calories here and there. Um, and it was strategic. Like it was, it wasn't like a, I'm going to binge eat and get back up to a ton. It was, I think it worked out to about whatever the calories were at the, at the end. We jumped to what they were four weeks prior to that and decreased the cardio and then held that for a couple of weeks and then slowly started increasing more food. This is great because that's it. So what you're saying is that you did a five month process almost. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm, and this is where my paradigm is kind of at right now because I, I see the differences between that cut and the one I'm currently doing mm -hmm. where I started that cut eating about 3000 calories a day. Body weights were about, I was maybe about two. Oh, you know what? I started at 240 because when I finished my meat, it was about 240 in both cases. I am, I started that diet at 3000 calories. I started this diet at 3,700 wow. because that's my new maintenance because I was so consistent in the interim between cuts. I was able to retrain my metabolism and get it to a point where my maintenance was around 35 to 3,700 calories. I've lost 15 pounds to date over since February 15th ish around Valentine's day. I've lost 15 pounds and I'm still eating 2,850 calories and I have not done a single cardio workout. So there's, there's a couple of things that I want to pinpoint so people can get where I'm going with this point is that, is that you see a lot of people will do like, you know, the, you did it over a five weeks. You went down, let's say starting at 3000 down to 1600. Then you went back up to, let's say 3000. Most people, what they're doing is they're starting at 3000 dropping to 1000 the next day trying mm -hmm. to do that for 30 days and then they go somewhere and then they're back up to 3000 per day and they wonder why their body is just, they're not getting lean. They look abused. They're tired. Yeah. They're beaten up. You know, whereas people like me and you are saying, Hey, if you're 3000, let's just bring you down to like 2,500, right? Get some organization, get some good food going, get some exercise, build a routine and then slowly start to chop it down. So you don't beat yourself up because you can't live in that type of deficit for that long and see results. So you'll get people who are so head and I get this a lot because I deal with athletes. You'll get people that are so headstrong that they can live at that thousand. Mm. They can't, they will fucking suffer. Excuse my language. No, that's but true. The, the, the biggest piece that I try to hit home and I just had this conversation with a friend of mine. She was like, you know, my maintenance is around 1800. I'm going to go down to 14. I was like, wow. When you go down to 14 and your metabolism slows down and your progress stops, where do you go? 13, 12. At that point you're starving. Why don't you go from 18 to 17? 
let yourself get progress. Then go to 16, then go to 15. And then or maybe an extra like, walk or you don't have to suffer. You don't have like, if you drop your calories that much, so many things happen. Your metabolism is going to slow down. You're going to have a hormonal cascade that puts you in a negative state for fat loss. You're going to have, um, decrease energy levels. We know that when you're in a caloric deficit, your meat goes down, your, your non-exercise physical activity goes down. Why don't you just get your non-exercise physical activity super high? So your daily energy expenditure is super high and then just slowly drop your calories. That's all I've done. I aim for about 10,000 steps a day right now on my two non weight training days of the week. I do conditioning because I love, I, I enjoy it. So I'll do conditioning, but I still get my 10,000 steps a day. I've lost 15 pounds. I'm still eating almost 3000 calories. So like for me that, that just hits home. And that's one of the things that I, I do a lot of nutritional coaching or counseling with my, my clients is aim for eating the most amount of food possible to achieve your goal. It's not about what you can do the least of it's if I can eat the most amount of food possible and keep losing weight, that's going to be the healthiest. percent. And so what are some of the, strategies that you use to educate your clients because you know this is the platform for that where we're trying to get people to understand that you know you, like i tell my clients if you want to do like a real fat loss let's do it over six weeks not two weeks right let's yes. come down slowly let's do as i say week one gpp let's just get everything ready general preparation phase two weeks we'll start to like come down every week and then we'll start to come back up every week after that right so this way it's coming down it's coming in whether it's a three-week period or it's a four-week period let's just not jump in, jump out. Right. And I think yeah. that's something that we've all as coaches probably made that mistake. Right. I, I made it a lot. It's like, Oh, let's just cut you down and worry about it after. Whereas now I would never do that. But the key is, is that I think what you said, and I love that there is that a lot of people say, well, I'm eating 1800 calories a day and I'm working out once a day and I'm doing 5,000 steps a day. Well, why don't you just go to 10,000 steps per day and not have to cut your calories and you can still feel great. And while just upping and increasing your list throughout the day. Right. So these, there's different strategies. It always doesn't have to be food. It can be combined with activity. Right. It can, can be combined with activity, but then you think about like the benefits of non-exercise physical activity. So like unstructured play or, uh, or walking or whatever you're getting outside. So you're getting vitamin D you're getting your blood, your, your blood circulating through your body. You're improving your aerobic capacity, which will increase your work capacity, which will let you train harder, which will let you recover harder. So all of these benefits come from just increasing your daily physical activity. And if you're increasing your physical daily activity, which is allowing you to train harder, that means you can burn more, burn more calories within your training session. You're indirectly influencing that, that calories in calories out just by walking more. You're, you're working on both sides of the equation because you're training harder and you're exercising more. So the other piece is that, when you're walking or moving, you're not hungry. <laughs> it's, uh, I think one of the things I've told my clients and I, you know, over Christmas, I just say after every meal, go for a 10 minute walk uh, because it also gets you away from food. You clean down the kitchen yeah. and then you can say kitchen's closed for three hours, right? So just that simple cue, like you said about timers and making sure you go for a walk at that 55 minute or 45 minute. same thing. You eat, you wash down the kitchen, you go for a walk, it improves digestion. It drops your blood sugar. And it also gets you away from food, right? Instead yeah. of just picking away at it. And uh, one of my big things is, is that uh, don't eat until you eat until the point where you say, if I take one more bite, I wouldn't want to go for a walk, right? It's just a good oh, settling, like that. right? That's why I tell my clients who don't want to weigh or track all their calories. I'll say, okay, just eat your portions to the point where you say, if I eat one more bite, I'm not going to go for a walk because then you're still going to have energy for the next three hours. Yeah. Whereas if you eat that one or two extra bites, you know, you're going to eat 13 more and then you're going to feel sleepy out. Now, yeah. how many cuts would you do on yourself uh, in a year? So, you know, because a lot of people are, when you talk to them, uh, they're 365 weight loss, right? And so one of the, this, this conversation we have a lot with clients is, okay, so you've done weight loss for three months. Now let's go into like maybe hypertrophy or performance or something different. So how many cuts? And, and, and feel free if you have some, uh, there's personal anecdotes, but if you have some clientele anecdotes as well, how many times do you recommend people actually work on going into a specific weight loss phase? So some the, to caveat this, it'll all depend on your goal. So personally sure. for me, if I'm training to get stronger, I do not want to be in a caloric deficit, plain and simple. 
Uh, and it's the same uh, advice I give all my clients is if, if you want to drop a weight class, you do that in the off season. Once you're training for a meet, we're at maintenance calories or in a slight surplus, then we're training for performance. Um, with clients, I'm very, I, I like using that delineating point of this feels sustainable versus this is shitty. So depending on what the person's goal is, because I work with powerlifters and I work with people who don't compete in sport as well. So it's, if I want to get leaner, I will diet the person up until the point where they feel like garbage. I will push a couple weeks more and then back off. Because I think that that couple weeks more, if they're able to be adherent, which is that that's the caveat, is that's where some serious changes can be made. And then you back off to a point where it's more sustainable. So when you drop calories, it's important to understand that your metabolism will also slow down. And I think that's what people miss the, miss the boat on. Your maintenance calories, quote unquote, is always changing. So my maintenance calories at 10,000 steps a day is different than my maintenance calories at 5,000 steps a day. My maintenance calories now at 221 pounds is drastically different than my maintenance calories when I was 240 pounds. Everything plays a role. So looking at the progress and looking at how you feel and what the scale is doing is going to be really important. So we will cut for a period of time and I'm very progressive with it. I'd never cut significant amounts of calories in one shot. Um, because my goal is to protect the training session at all costs. Um, and I do coach people on like workout nutrition, which I actually had a really cool conversation with my mom about this morning. But um, so we will cut to a point where they feel like their performance is dropping. I'll push that a couple more weeks. Then we'll start to reintroduce calories and we'll spend at least a half, like at least I try to get, depending on the timeline that they're looking at, at least the duration of the diet at maintenance. So if we dieted for eight to 10 weeks, I wanna spend at least eight to 10 weeks at maintenance because what we'll find is that maintenance a lot of calories will go up, which is cool because you'll get to a point where, hey, I've lost say 12 pounds. And then when we started increasing food, we gained about three or four, but we're eating more food now nine pounds heavier or nine pounds lighter than we were when we were nine pounds heavier because our metabolism caught up and that's a really cool place to be. And then you've already built that base of healthy behaviors so that when you jump back into the cut the next time, your first initial progress will be much quicker and you won't have to suffer as much. Like I'm noticing the personal anecdote here. When I was dieting two years ago, I was miserable I'm fucking great right now. I'm still getting stronger. I set a couple PRs in the gym. Like I got no issues right now and I've lost 15 pounds, but it's because I've built those behaviors over time to know what I need to do in order to keep progress going. So, so what are some of those? So tell me about what are the top five behaviors that you think that every single person today listening could benefit from doing every day? Like what are those, you know, like those five top nutrition non-negotiables that you think every I'm sure that you because you deal yeah. with the cool part about you is that you deal with high performance yeah. and you deal with you know general pop yep um, for sure. but, but what's interesting is there's got to be five characteristics oh, that absolutely. are the same for all those so what are those what are those top two or three or five that you know for sure that you need to be doing to be successful whether your performance weight loss what are those five so number one is sleep hygiene so sleep is when we recover it's when our hormones reset themselves. It's, it, it is the most important. If you have poor sleep, it's going to be a silent killer, blood pressure issues, blood sugar regulation issues, all that stuff. So protect your sleep. Do you Number two trackers to your clients or anything like an aura ring or a loop bend. Have you ever tried any of those or big, no? I'm not a big proponent of those simply because of the reliability of the data. Gotcha. If you're waking up feeling rested, you're having good sleep. If you wake up groggy, you're not having good sleep, plain and simple. Um, but it's important to have something that you're able to track those, those reflections on it. Uh, and that's where Metri life will come in later on. But so sleep hygiene, number one, two is stress management. If you are constantly stressed all day, you have a high level of cortisol all day, you're drinking coffee all day. That brings a whole host of other problems. So manage your stress, keep your caffeine moderate. 
Um, doesn't mean you can't drink coffee. Just means you know maybe you cut it off at two p.m. What's your uh, limit? On, what's your limit that you usually work with your clients on coffee? Do you have like a limit of where you say, "Hey guys, like if you're going over one to two cups, there could be an underlying issue," or do you have a, a limit or anything of concern? I only address it if so. Say we get to a point and their sleep quality is really bad, I'll address it. Like, how many cups of coffee are you having gotcha. a day? I gotcha. use that kind of as a, a gauge. Yeah. So, sleep, stress. Number two is prep your food. Or number three, prep your food. So I like to prep my food uh, three times a week, personally. Uh, most people can get away with either one big one and then freezing it or two. Um, if you do two, it's less time in one shot. Uh, I work from home, so I'm pretty spoiled in the fact that like, I can throw on some chicken, set a timer for 30 minutes, and then go back up and get it. Um, but I know for a fact most people can't do that. And in, in with prep your food is prep your meals the day before. So if you're going to be leaving, prep your meals the night before. It takes 15 minutes. Have, a, have a, a bowl of rice, a bowl of beef, a bowl of chicken, and a bowl of vegetables, and then just make your meals. So like that's what I do. Um, so we got sleep. We got stress. We got meal prep. Four is neat. So keep your daily physical energy expenditure high. Um, if you're able to do that, it's, it's a game changer. Um, and then number five is going to sound super like, <laughs> like no brainer. It's eat real food. <laughs> but you don't take, I know. Cause you know why I love that you say that because you know, a lot of these influencers, you know, like there's a couple of guys that I follow that when you listen to their podcasts, their social media and them don't match. Right. Cause all they're showing is I eat jujubes, jubes. I drink beer. But then when you talk to them on the podcast, like, Oh yeah, 85% of the time I'm eating real food. Right. But, you know, what gets the likes is me having a beer, a cheeseburger and a poutine. Right. So yeah. I love that. Like, so, it's again, I am not, I'm not the typical client that I would see. So for example, I've been dieting since, or I, quote unquote, I've been dieting since February 5th. I haven't missed a macro since February 5th and we're May 18th. That doesn't exist in real life, but it, it's just how I'm wired. Um, so it's finding strategies that work across all, all frames of reference that allow people to come as close as they can to meeting their goals each day. And I think the thing is too, that you also love it though, right? I, I, I think that's something that I've come to a conclusion too, that a lot of clients are like, Oh, I just can't. I'm like, you know, if you just turned into putting these habits together, but actually enjoying like, you know, when I eat my rice, like today I had lamb and berries. I love mm -hmm. that meal. I truly love that meal. And I mm -hmm. think that I like working out. I like going for walks. I enjoy drinking water. I think too many people try to put a chore behind it. Yes. Like, oh, I'd rather be drinking beer. No, you wouldn't because everything you told us in your intake forms was you want to be the opposite, but they make it a chore. They make it like a punishment. Well, I said, making yourself better is something amazing. But so do you have a percentage of real food that you give your clients to say, Hey, like 80% or not? Cause obviously it sounds like you're like a macro and calorie. So do you say, for example, out of these 15,000 calories per week, I want to make sure that 14,000 in the real, keep your thousand to yourself with something that's flexible, or do you just kind of leave it up to the client to do that? Or do you kind of give yourself percentages? It depends. I've never done the percentages thing. Um, I'm very big on like, and I also don't give all my clients macros. Like some mm -hmm. of them will work off portion sizes because they don't want to, they don't want to count. They don't want to measure. They they yes. just can't be bothered. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll figure out something that you can do that allows us some form of control, quote unquote, of this variable that is diet. When you're dealing with high performance athletes, we're trying to reduce variables. So if I know how many macros you're eating of what, what, and what, well, that's a variable that's controlled for. So if your performance goes down, I know where to look. Um, when you get to the flexibility of the plan, I educate them throughout. It's like, if you want to have a pop tart after training, if that's probably going to be the best time that you're going to have a pop tart, cause it's going to spike your insulin and help you, you know, replenish glycogen and all that stuff. But just know that that's not going to be very filling and out of your caloric budget of the day, it's going to be quite a bit. So you have to factor that in. And, and if we're dieting, it's all well and good to have those foods in it. You know, it's not ideal, but as your calories and macros drop, there's just less room for that because or else you're going to be starving. Like if I only give you, if we're at the tail end of a diet and you're only eating 150 grams of carbs or hundred grams of carbs a day, that pop tart is 75% of your daily carbs. 
<laughs> like, yeah. are you really going to want to, it's, it's like if you're broke, right? You have your last hundred dollars. What are you going to spend it on? You know, I'm going to spend that hundred dollars on, you know, some spaghetti squash and some cruciferous vegetables and things that fill me up and provide me nutrition. Like I'm not going to spend it on a pop tart. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. And so what are some of the, for yourself and your clients? So I, the first thing is, I love the fact that you talk about how you have to learn the client, right? I think that's something that, Definitely. you know, a lot of trainers or a lot of people that I see on social media, it's just like calories in, calories out. This is the only way, this is what it is. But the reality is, is that we have to learn the client. And I've been saying this more and more, the more you learn your client, the easier it is to coach them because you can really, you know, kind of pinpoint how to work with them. And there's not one model to receive success. Now, what are some of the top five foods that you yourself or foods that you recommend to your clients uh, that they say that they really notice a difference eating them? So what would you say your top like power foods are? I hate using that term, but yeah, but what are some, what are five foods? Let's reverse that question. What are five foods that you know for yourself make you feel amazing? I love hearing that because it's so different from each person. So that ties into like what you just alluded to is like the science is the science, but you can have the most scientifically founded plan. If it cannot be adhered to, it doesn't matter. So that's where the coach comes in and learning the client. So I found like, I thought about this question a lot and I I didn't know kind of where I wanted to take it because I'm a big, I'm a big red meat guy. I think bang for your buck, protein, healthy fats, um, micronutrients, iron. It's a, it's a big hit item. The next is fruit. I think people forget how good fruit is. And so, they get, so name the fruit. Did you have a specific fruit you enjoy or just say all? Oh, I don't, I really yeah. don't. Like, I, gotcha. eat, I eat berries, I eat tropical fruit. I eat, uh, I eat an apple before every training session just cause I think it's delicious. Like so most, like I try to get all my clients to eat at least two pieces of fruit a day or two servings of fruit a day. Um, the thing most people forget fruit, although it is sugar, it's fructose. Fructose, your liver loves fructose. So if your liver is happy, your digestion is going to be happy. It's high in fiber. So it's metabolized slower. So while it is a sugar, it's not necessarily metabolized the same way. Uh, the next is salt. So when people start dieting, what they forget is if you're cutting out calories and those calories are coming from carbohydrates, Every gram of glycogen is four grams of water. When you lose muscle glycogen, you deplete water. Water brings electrolytes with it. So you you ever find anyone who goes onto a ketogenic diet, they drop a ton of weight really quickly, but feel like crap. That's because they're electrolyte deficient. And that, that extra salt on your food makes a huge difference. And then when you put it towards performance, you need salt for cognitive function. You need salt for muscle contraction. You need salt to lubricate your joints. Salt is a superfood. Um, not to mention it's iodized, so it helps you with your thyroid, um, whole eggs. I think a lot of people forget how good whole eggs are. They're a great source of protein, choline, uh, omega fatty acids. Um, yes, they are high in cholesterol. We know that cholesterol, eating cholesterol doesn't necessarily increase your chances of having high cholesterol and you need cholesterol for organ, uh, hormone production. Um, and then the final one is like green leafy vegetables. Like, right. Fill your body with things that have the highest micronutrient content. So think, think micronutrient content and then transfer it into macros. I like fruits. I like vegetables, not necessarily just because of the volume, but I have never met someone who got fat eating too many vegetables. Or even fruit. Like or in even that fruit. Sense, right? um, so we, like I never, even if I'm tracking macros with a client, I never have them track their vegetables ever. It's just a waste of time. It's tedious. Um, I like to mix my vegetables. So I'm not going to measure how many carrots I had and how many cucumbers. You eat carrots though? Whoa. I do. I know. Super high high in sugar. (laughs) This conversation is over your thing. I love when people say to me, Harry, I don't eat carrots. There's too much sugar. I'm like, you ate ice cream three times this week. Before coming in, we're scared of carrots. It's like, wait a second. We've just lost everything out there. Cognitive dissonance is is ridiculous. But uh, yeah, so... Meat, fruit, vegetables, salt, whole eggs. I think there you're there. I, I and leafy greens. I, I can't. I'm. I you know. I was saying to my clients. Um, I always say there's two types of clients. You can either do low. I, I'm a person who likes low variety of food, um, and I don't really like to calorie restrict. 
I just yep. kind of like want to know. So, you know, I've come to this conclusion that if I pick up a book upstairs in my library and it's either on digestion, hormonal health, um, performance, these are the foods you'll come up with. Meat, fish or eggs will always be there. Mm -hmm. uh, leafy greens, broccoli, cauliflower, mm -hmm. uh, berries, olive oil, sweet potatoes, tea, broth, maybe lemons will probably be in a nut. All nuts are kind of have some kind of micronutrient health to it. Yep. If I was to pull out, like that's what I eat. I don't really deviate too much from those foods. That way when I do go out with friends, I can have a cocktail or have something with them. But I've really come to the conclusion exactly what you said. And salt would be a power food. But if you start to look at the foods that make people's diet simple and mm -hmm. just feel nutritious and just start feeling better, I'm convinced that those 10 foods will always pop up, right? And anybody who I talk to who's worked with a lot of people, you know, because the red meat thing or the protein thing right now is kind of turning into a, not a debate, but it's people are like, oh, well, you know, I heard meat isn't good for you. It's like, but wait a second, whenever you deal with a client, I'm sure you have clients that come in and you ask them, how do you feel out of one to 10? They might say five out of 10. And when they start to eat more meat, uh, they start to say, hey, we feel a lot better. Yeah, without right? fail. Without right. fail. And, and a lot of people don't know what feeling good is. Um, there are times when I do not prescribe, like, if, if you want to talk about like optimal protein ranges, when we talk about performance, you're looking at like 0.8 to 1.2 is going to be that sweet spot for people. If you're trying to gain weight and you're eating a surplus of calories, you don't need as much protein because, because your insulin is going to be higher because you're eating a surplus of calories. So that's going to be protein sparing. So you don't need to eat as much. Then if you're dieting, we know that protein is going to be anti-catabolic, but it also has a high satiety rate. So you push that protein up high, up into that 1.2 range. It also has a lower caloric yield per pound per gram. So you're only assimilating about 70% of the calories in, in protein. So while you may be eating, you get to a point where a client might be eating 1800 calories, but then you shift some of those calories to higher protein and then their weight comes down, but their calories stay the same higher thermic effect of food, lower Huge. caloric yield, higher, all that stuff. So it's, and knowing that and knowing how people respond is really important to kind of getting that buy-in because you might adjust their diet and they say, well, I'm eating the same amount of calories. And I'm just like, ah, just trust me. Yeah. Trust me. And so then resources wise, what are some resources that you send people to for nutrition? Do you use, who do you use? Who does Paul use for resources to learn about more about nutrition? Um, a lot of my knowledge on nutrition comes from my education, obviously. Yeah. Um, but for nutrition, I'm, I'm big on the Renaissance periodization group. Yeah. Um, they are, they do a terrific job. Uh, Lane Norton does a terrific job of clarifying, um, like, especially with when it comes to, if it's, it's your macros type dieting, yeah. uh, the RP, the Renaissance periodization guys, when it comes to like, nutrient timing they do a fantastic job uh simplifying the approach um those two do great uh I'm trying to think off the top of my head um like the yeah i think those two off the top of my head those two come yeah. come sure. first and foremost um but i think most people would stand to focus less on the minutia of science and focus more on those big rocks of behaviors because the science. Okay. Let's draw a parallel here. So we're talking workout nutrition. So intra workout nutrition. If you're a science person and you're trying to run a 10 K, you know, it's probably going to take you about an hour and 30 minutes because you're a novice runner, but your goal for running that 10 K is because you're using it as a means to lose body fat. Well, if you were all about the science, you would know that for the highest level of performance for exercise over, over an hour, you're going to be, want to be adding about 10 grams of carbohydrates per every 15 minutes of exercise over an hour. So then you're this person who wants to lose weight, but then you start eating 50, 10 grams of sugar for every 15 minutes extra you exercise. Yeah. You're missing the point. Your goal is to mobilize fatty acids. Your goal is to lose body fat. You do not need to be supplementing with carbohydrates in your training. Even if it's the best thing you can do for your performance, it's not something you need to be doing for your goals. 
So look at your goals, look at the big rocks, turn over the big rocks. And then once you have the big rocks focused on like that big pick, those big picture items of healthy behaviors and habits, then you can dive into the science side. Because if you look at the things that are going to make you successful, even as a high performance athlete, I could put together a plan that is like macros for the day, macros per meal, an approved food list, nutrient timing, different meals, uh, different meal options on training days and rest days. But if you can't figure out if a, a, an orange is a fat or a carb, <laughs> it doesn't really matter about the plan that I put together for you. So my, my work with my clients is very, very, very basic to start. And it always increases in complexity. And regardless of every progression I have in place, I always know a regression. And that's, where, that's the best place to be. So those two resources, RP, Lane Norton, uh, yourself? Myself. I mean, I'm, pretty good. I'm pretty good. You're yourself, you know. Um, are you guys taking on, are you taking on new clients right now or are yeah. you full? Okay. Yeah, I'm taking on new clients. Uh, you know, I lost a few clients on the training side when COVID started. Yeah. Uh, one thing I did do, uh, and I, I know a lot of people who did do this as well as I know a lot of people who didn't, but I, some of my clients weren't able to work during this time. So I may not have, like I had one guy who's like, I can't, I can't pay you. I'm like, that's fine. Don't pay me, but I want you to check in with me every Saturday still. And, and you know, that to me, that was nothing because it's an email and a reply, but for him, it was accountability. And so that like, I've done that for a few clients. There are some clients I still program for because they might still have access to a gym, but they just can't afford to pay me. That's fine. Um, I know that that's going to be business that comes back to me tenfold in the future. It's so funny because I was talking to clients and, you know, I'm trying to do my best to call them or email them, see how they're doing, how's yeah. everything going. And they're telling me that some of the people that they've worked with, that they've been training with for two times a week for, let's say, three years, I haven't even called them once. I'm like, how is that even, how do you sleep? I guess for me, I, I said to myself, how do you sleep? Right. Yeah. And I think that there's, you know, there's still this like, you know, hey, like we have a connection, even though you're not paying me right now, doesn't mean I'm going to give up on you. And I still enjoyed our friendships. Now, obviously, there's some clients that you and I probably worked with in the past that were like, mm, you know what, I'm probably not going to call that person because there was no connection or something like that. But, you know, there's still 80% to 90% of the people that you work with. And I still send out emails to clients that I'm not working with. They're on our email list. We're still sending out stuff. I got a Facebook group that we don't kick you out if you ever work in our coaching group because I believe there's still human connection. But it's amazing to see how many people have just like dropped their clients and I'm like, guys, that is not good for your business long term. Right? In the same breath though, I've seen so many people who are incredibly committed to their health and fitness. It's amazing. Just absolutely fall off the train. And, and I'm, I look myself in the mirror and I'm like, is there anything I can do to help the person who might be doing that? If I can help them stay on track. And, and, and I think that's like the biggest thing as a coach is like knowing knowing that you're invested in someone's success as much as they are, that is a role that you need to embrace. And if you're one of these people who's just in it to, to make a, make a paycheck, I have wrong, you know, wrong a lot of respect for that. Yeah. Okay. I think the key is too, is that uh, one thing I know that what I've learned, and you've probably heard this, uh, achieving your goals uh, helps other people achieve the world's goals. So by you achieving your goals, you'll help the world achieve the bigger goal. And I've learned that more and more because a lot of my clients were saying that they're at work and they're just eating their food. They're not really talking about it. Then a month later, people are like, Hey, you're losing weight. You look good. What's going on? Oh, you know, just eating my food. And the next thing you know, they start eating that same meal. So by them just wanting to achieve their goals and not put it onto other people, just do the work. Other people start to do it. And I think as you know, coaching, that's why I started my post-workout thoughts there because a lot of people said, you know, I do my videos and they're like, hey, you know, it really felt good after that. And I'm like, yeah, I can share a little bit more, but it's the fact that we enjoy this, we embrace it, we share what we want to share. And mm -hmm. I think that just is a good motivation. But yeah, it's been, it's been a wild time to see what's happening with COVID in terms of, you know, you're right, there's the people falling off. Falling, and, 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 and then there's the good cool part is, you know, um, I usually work with about 200 clients at a time, like in and out, and I'll see them throughout three months. Um, and about 100 of them are like, Harry, I want to be in the best shape of my life. And they've really taken this time to, you know, they're doing the, you know, two walks a day. They're doing their workouts for 20 minutes because now there's so many amazing free platforms out there for mm -hmm. people to work out. And, and, you know, so they're taking advantage of it. They're making their food. They're learning recipes. They bought the Instapots. They bought the Ninja food. And so it's super cool to see the investment and in people taking the time 
to come in because post COVID we're all going to be pretty tired having to go back out there. So uh, hopefully gyms will start to open up. And so uh, what I want to make sure is that we talk about this Metro life. So obviously yeah. I can see that, I mean, we got a good history of where Paul's come from. So worked with university collegiates, worked in rehab, worked with, you know, athletes, worked with general population. So Metro life is probably a, a, a fruition of all of those uh, yeah. departments. So tell us about Metro life. So Metro life came about, um, in 20, 2014, um, my business partner, Jay Nira, who owns CrossFit O-Town, um, yeah. Dynamo Barbell here in Ottawa. Um, he approached me with this idea of a way to track our athletes preparedness for training. He was like, I think we can do a better job of adjusting our training based on this, like our people's lifestyle. Cause we know that the 22 hours outside the gym are more impactful to our goals than the 20, the two hours that we spend in the gym. So from there, we got in touch with a software developer, end up switching teams a couple times. And we came out with what Metri life is today, which is, it's an intelligent approach to living healthier, happier, and stronger, whereby people are able to track their lifestyle metrics and receive reminders and recommendations on how to improve their behaviors towards their goals. And we built it on a platform of education. So it's never about if A, then B. It's if A, maybe it's B, but it could also be C through Z. Here are some ideas of where to look for the answers, but it's all based on your inputs into the app. So you're tracking your daily, uh, we call that our number one uh, premise is the wellness score, which is 10 questions that are valuable to all people at all times. Things like sleep duration and quality, dietary compliance, uh, stress, libido, things that are important. Then we have our mental health score. So a mental health score, we worked with the program manager at the CMHA. It's five questions that you answer each day. And those questions rotate every day for a month within one question with each, each domain of mental health that gives you a score. So over time you're, you're gaining an awareness of your day-to-day -day trends in these metrics. MetriLife also provides you prompts of based on your inputs. It'll, uh, it will, correlate those with trajectories that are built in and we have an algorithm that will remind people before those trajectories take place of hey we've noticed that your wellness and your mental health are declined here is why we think it's happened here is what may be impacting it do you want to look further and then it prompts more introspection so we make you more aware we prompt you to be more introspective you learn about the, the associations between your activities, your habits, and your outcomes, and which prompts you to make the appropriate decision moving forward of how to change those for the better. There's no gamification. There's no rewards. It, it is you taking the driver's seat of your own life and working towards making changes. So how long would that take someone in a day? less than four minutes. If you use, if you answer every single pack within the app, which I do every day and do all of the journaling prompts, it takes me less than four minutes a day. Gotcha. So let's, so like, uh, like you're not even, you're while you're making your coffee, if you make yeah. it properly, uh, you're talking, that's how long it'll take. Yeah. And so what, what I do is I actually will, while my eggs are, be, are cooking, yeah. I'll put it. So there's three journals that I like doing in the app first thing in the morning. So I'll do those three journal entries while my eggs are cooking. And so then in terms of, is it free right now? Is it, is there a cost to it? Yeah. So we actually, so the app initially came out as a subscription model. Um, during COVID we we're like, listen, with all the things that people are battling, then you add a financial constraint. This is a tool that can help people. So we made the core functions of the app free. Okay. Um, we, we, we invested in it. We, we paid for the development. We're like, we're going to pay money to make this free so that more people have access to it. Um, and so far the, uh, the uptake on the free version has been very good. Um, the paid version is coming. Like people are, are learning and the more they see what the free version can do, they're upgrading to that premium, um, which is great for business, but obviously the goal the goal with the decision to make it free and the goal with the decision to create the app in the first place is true to our mission statement as a company, which is to help, to help put people in the driver's seat of their own lives.
to challenge the paradigm of training, to challenge the paradigm of my health or my performance and my mental health are different. Your body is a systematically integrated organism. Everything impacts everything else. And there's no other app on the, in the app store that combines lifestyle variables into an easy to digest package like we do. And we're really proud of it. Awesome. And so what's the, uh, what's the, are you getting a lot of good feedback on it and people are getting, yeah. how did it go with the COVID-19 that it increase and get more people? It's been about the same. The free version definitely increased our usership on the free side. Awesome. Uh, the, the premium side has been about the same growing very slowly. Uh, we did, I think we did it the right way. We put out a product in May of last year where it was kind of like, this is what we want to do. We got as much feedback as we could. We put that all into practice. And around January, we updated the software to this new version that, that is available now. Um, way more user friendly, way quicker, um, way better interface. And, uh, we have had nothing but positive feedback about this one. I just download, I'm going to do it for two weeks. Nice. I commit to two weeks every day. I'll do it. Awesome. Um, I, I like, I have a whoop band, right? Yep. We, we lend out, we have a whoop band in our, in our practice that we lend out to clients Okay. so they can learn a little bit more about their sleep so we can track things. So we just give them more information, but I, I'm going to give it a shot for two weeks and I'll, I'll give you my feedback as well. And I would love it. some yeah. of our clients that give it a shot as well, because auto based company, right? So we want to yep. support local and we want to see Absolutely. what it's all about to, you know, I'm all about little tracking measures that can help me just, kind of learn more about myself. Yeah. Uh, I talk about that a lot with my clients doing, you know, love languages and discs and chronotyping. So anything we can learn more about ourselves really does help clients. And would you say now, what is it helped? What would it help a person like me? So, you know, obviously you have a goal behind it, but what would I notice? Or what have you been hearing feedback? So with yourself, people? you're, you're looking at someone who's already very regimented like me. So, I, the thing that I gain insight on is the interaction between variables. So I might know that, you know, my sleep last night was pretty bad, but you know, my stress was moderate. I might have an okay training session, but if my stress was really high and my sleep was good, so that same situation, but reversed, my training might suck. So it's like, how do I manipulate the variables in my lifestyle to the best of my ability to get the most out of my training? I think we spend way too much time thinking about like, I didn't have a great day today, so I'm gonna train light, rather than the training is the same. I'm gonna train my ass off. How do I manipulate this outside thing so that I can train my ass off? And that, just like diet, just like your maintenance calories, that's always changing. Everything is always in flux. And so I'm having a better awareness and understanding of yourself goes so far into this. Like, like I said, I might be dieting, but I'm still hitting PRs in the gym, still managing my stress. Like, and that's because of Metri life. And, and I, I can speak from the heart and say that through some of the hardest times in my life this last year, Metri life has allowed me to navigate those to a better, a better place. And, and I don't think many people can say that about a product they built. Like I get really fired up when I start talking about it. That's the beautiful part about having owners talk about their product, right? It's, it's, it's that you know all the fine details you've put in your heart, you've put in your soul into this. And that's why, you know, we just had an oil, uh, Aurelius Foods on our last mm -hmm. podcast. And it was just crazy, amazing and passionate to see him just tell us about olive oil. But he loved it. He truly loved it. And I think that uh, those kind of passions are what build connection to a company and why yep. people want to do that product to see, hey, like, and you know, you've had success in the powerlifting world, the coaching world, you know, you've traveled, you've done work both sides of the border. And to me, that's yeah. a resume that speaks impact over, even if you didn't have masters beside you, the fact that you've had that level of impact and exposure, I think is something that we can all take as, you know, proof that there's gotta be something in this app that is gonna have a resonant with me because you have experience working with so many people. So gotta be, I'm guaranteed to learn something about myself. So I'm going to do it for the next two weeks to see what it's all about. Thank you, man. That means a lot. I really so, appreciate that. So we'll have some fun with that. But Paul, that was a great podcast. Yeah, man. I I, that was, that was, there's a lot of things talked about. And uh, so how do people get a hold of you? So your what's your Instagram handle? So Metrolife, yeah, so, all that yep. stuff. Tell us all about it. So Metrilife is at Metrilife. So M-E-T-R-I-L-I-F-E -I -I -E underscore yeah. on Instagram or www.metrilife.com. Uh, myself, you can find me at Paul O'Neid, so P-A-U-L-O-N-E-I-D. 
Um, my coaching is available at www.masterathletic.com. Um, or you can just find me on Instagram, send me a DM and, and I, I'll forward you over there. Um, really excited about uh, continuing to build on things and, and where, where this can go in the future. Yeah. So you're still taking clients. So there you go, yep. folks. He's still taking on clients. He's still, you do nutrition, you do the train, you'll do everything, right? So I'll do everything. Yeah. And if I don't, these- you know, if, if it's out of my wheelhouse, I'll send them to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in terms of, oh, thank you. Uh, the, the key for me is um, in terms of COVID. So if they don't have a gym or they don't really have, you're still able to do programming and workouts, yep. all that kind of stuff. So that's yep. good. Um, no, it's good. I think we need to promote more of local Ottawa, right? I don't call it a competition. I call it cooperation because, oh, absolutely. you know, I know there's a limit on my skills and there's a limit on who I can work with. And I'm sure you feel the same way oh, um, man, yeah. about that. And I think one of the big things is that we have different, um, I have a different focus than you are, but at the same time, we all have our people that we're going to connect to. Right, like yeah, and, I get to. You probably, I mean, I, listen. I know there's people that have worked with me. Like, I didn't like them. Yeah, it's guaranteed. I, I've, I've worked with over 4,500 people in four years. Yeah. But there's my select few. Well, the 80 percent that I'm really going to connect with and resonate. And for me, I'm more of an education space. Uh, whereas I like you're really like personalized, everyday kind of detail with the workouts and everything. Whereas I do nutrition, sleep, lifestyle management. We we get nitty and gritty with clients but you have a, a, a next level approach that I think people need to know more about. Right. And if they want to go to that, they're going to need coaching like yourself. For sure. And this isn't a zero sum game. Like the more people that we get into the, into interested in nutrition, interested in training, this isn't like a, there's a dollar amount up in the sky and we're all fighting for it. The more good work that we do, that dollar amount gets bigger. That number of people gets bigger. We're all able to build our businesses if we all help each other out. And that's, and I think yeah. during this COVID time, you know, people, you know, some people let go of their health, but I look at, you know, the root of all the stuff that's out there about COVID is, you know, take care of your health and no better time for all of us to start saying to ourselves that yes, we have stresses during COVID right now, but also our decision-making is down a little bit, right? We don't have to worry about going to take the bus or being stuck in traffic or worrying about what to wear. Right? You know, I'm in my gym basement right now uh, in like, a, you know, my top and, I could be in shorts and PJs. I got my Crocs on for sure. Um, nice. But you know, we have that flexibility to have less decision, but really focus on you know making good food. And I think that there's uh, tons of benefits that will come from this. But no better time to take care of your health. And you know, 100%. guys like you are doing it, and I love it because you've been doing it for so long. And that's why I wanted to have you on it. I read your stuff every day, so I appreciate your time and commitment, and I appreciate you taking time on this you know beautiful day to do a podcast. With me. It's my pleasure, man. Thank you so much for having okay. me. Thank you, and we'll talk with you soon. Yes, sir. Okay, take care.